everyone. Um, I would like to introduce your speaker this morning, uh, Tom Eastman. Tom works for the Kraken sponsor that we have, and he'll, he has attended every PyCon Australia we've had so far. Uh, I think that's 10 years worth, which is great. Um, Tom loves to talk about many, many things. He's a great person to have conversations with, so if you do want to talk more about this talk afterwards, find him at the Kraken booth at lunchtime, and he will happily talk your ear off. Or let you go if you need to. Um, please uh, provide a warm, welcoming applause for Tom. Hey, I'm Tom. Um, who has heard me talk about Secateur before in this room? Quite a few of you. Cool, cool, cool. Because it's this is the third talk that I've given on this what was just like a silly little Django side project um, that kind of grew a little bit out of control. And so there's a lot of detail that I might skip over, and I'm more than happy to talk about that stuff, or you can check out my previous two talks on the subject. Um, just a bit of a content warning. This is a talk about a tool to protect people from social media harassment, so I'm probably going to be mentioning some of the things, some of the sorts of harassment that kind of happen on Twitter. Um, I'm not going to dwell on any of it, but that means that there might be mentions of transphobia and homophobia and stuff like that, just because that's the kind of awful shit that happens on Twitter. Um, the project's dead now, and we're going to go into detail. We're going to go into a little bit of detail on that. So this is kind of just a recap of why I built it, what I learned along the way. It's kind of a grab bag of, of, of anecdotes and things that happened. Uh, maybe some of this will be useful lessons. Um, maybe it won't be. Some of it will hopefully be a little bit entertaining. Some of it will be a little bit surreal. Um, I'm going to try to play a tiny bit of a question that I received at 2019 when I first launched this uh, tool. You, there we go. Have you done any threat modeling on sort of the impact that this could directly place onto you by being the creator of this app with like, because your GitHub name is out there, how like your DNS creds, that kind of stuff. Have you done anything to sort of cover yourself when it comes to building a tool like this that, you know, assholes with too much time on their hands can just start and play with? A little, but only in so far as my GitHub account has also got 2FA on it. Most of, most of what's important to me has reasonable protections on it. My real name is, of course, everywhere. Um, I am Tom Eastman. That is actually on my birth certificate. I'm findable. Someone could hack my runkeeper and possibly find out where I lived. There's, there's interesting things once you become a target yourself. Um, I, again, get to. Okay, I'm going to stop there, but that's a little bit of foreshadowing. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to that a little bit. Um, don't, don't worry about it. It's cool. Um, so what, what is Secateur? Secateur is a little tiny web app. Um, it uses the Twitter API to allow someone to block a person who's harassed on Twitter and all of their followers for a set period of time. So if someone is attacking you on Twitter and they have like 20,000 followers and they're sending their followers after you, um, you can hit one button and you can block them and you can block all of their followers. Uh, the, it gave them, it, it, and it did it for a set period of time. So um, it kind of gave you two advantages over the usual sort of Twitter protection mechanism that they had. It gave you the ability to neutralize a large group of people who are sort of trying to dogpile you, which is one of Twitter's great innovations in harassment. Um, and it gave you the freedom to do it fairly ruthlessly because you knew that like, because you could block people temporarily, um, you knew that if you accidentally blocked uh, nice people while you were doing it, they would automatically be unblocked eventually. And I found that to be a really useful tool. Um, in my original talk on the subject, I mentioned that Twitter allows you to mute topics for a set period of time. Um, so they like, have mechanisms inbuilt. They understand the value of being able to protect yourself temporarily from like Star Wars spoilers, but not from Nazis. I don't know. Um, it was a really unsophisticated UI. This is basically the only uh, interactive piece of the entire app. Uh, this is what it looks like because I'm a pretty good Python programmer, I'm a pretty good backend programmer, and I am just, I'm just useless at HTML and CSS and, and UX. Um, it's just not what I do. So for the Python developers here, this app wasn't a lot to write home about. Okay, four Django models sort of mirroring some of what um, Twitter's data model looks like, a, couple, a, a half a dozen or a dozen generic Django views, you know, a list detail, model detail, uh, literally one form, as, which you just saw. 
Um, a dozen or so celery tasks, and that's where some of the clever stuff happened. Um, a crappy bootstrap UI. Um, not a lot to it, uh, but it worked pretty hard, and the celery tasks were probably the more interesting part. I'm going to run through uh, a, an encapsulated timeline of how this came about. Uh, I first had the idea um, in 2016 at LCA, actually, um, when I was talking to a online activist who had been involved in protecting people from Gamergate. Um, and I had the idea of, like, maybe this would be something that would be useful for people. And then I didn't do anything with it for two years because ideas are easy and implementation is hard. Uh, in 2018, I finally started writing code. And I wrote it very much because I wanted it. Um, Twitter in 2018 was just post Charlotte, Charlottesburg. There was like a lot of ugliness there. Um, and yet, it was a place where, because of my toxic relationship with social media, I spent a lot of time there. Um, I wrote it in Django, but I wrote it for myself, and that meant that it was largely command line interface. It was really just local database and stuff. But I knew that it would be a benefit for other people. So I, I knew eventually I was going to get it online, but that would involve writing HTML and writing CSS and you know the stuff that I don't like doing that much. Um, most of the development for Secatura happened in fits and starts in like do nothing on it for months and then like a sprint of like a day or a weekend's hyper focused work or, or a week's worth of work. Um, a lot of it was conference driven development, which I'm sure several of you are familiar with. Uh, so it's not a coincidence that it only finally got launched like a couple days before PyCon AU 2019 because I was giving a talk on it and that's like, oh crap, I'd better actually finish this thing. Um, it had its first couple of users who weren't me by then, a couple of people who needed to protect themselves from uh, transphobic attacks. Um, and effectively, people first started signing into it during my talk in, uh, at, Q at PyCon AU in 2019. By the end of the year, it had a couple hundred users. Um, in 2020, things went a little bit more nuts. Uh, lockdown happened. Uh, Everyone was spending more time on Twitter. Uh, I, in about, let's see, is my mouse on screen? Yep, yep, yep. Um, in about May, I stopped it requiring an invitation to join. Like, you could sign up, but then I would have to push a button to enable your account. And I just let people sign up freely. Um, and I also changed one feature, which was, if I go back to that form, I added the forever button there because I thought that the key feature was the temporary blocking, but I added the ability to let someone block forever. Um, usage started to spread and started to get popular. And the server that I was running it on um, started falling over all the time because I was running it on a T2 tiny, then a T2 small, then a T2 medium. Um, I, had, I, I've, I go into a lot of detail on this in a, in a different talk, but um, I spent a lot of time working on keeping it running on one instance of one Amazon device because I wanted the cost to be predictable. When you think about a technical platform like this, you can easily design it in your head such that it would be like, I don't know, you'd use lambdas to do the API calls, and you'd use DynamoDB, and you could make it infinitely horizontally scalable and therefore infinitely ex expensive, which is a bad idea for a hobby project. Um, it crashed a lot in 2020. And so the talk that I gave uh, in 2020 at PyCon AU is probably the most technical one on the subject because I, I learned a lot about tuning Postgres and AWS GP2 IOPS exhaustion caused by disk writes from the database and RAM exhaustion swapping to the disk. Um, but yeah, like, I, I thought I had solved the scaling problems. I, thought, I, I, thought I didn't think it was going to get too much more popular than that. Um, I'm going to just zoom the graph out a little bit for the context of where we were. Um, <laughs> In, by the end of 2021, it had 30,000 users. So it, 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 it kind of, it's, it's spread entirely by like word of mouth, I think. Um, and it was basically just doing quite a lot of work. Um, I didn't do pretty much any development on it in 2021. I was too busy. Um, by the end of 2022, it had 60,000 users. And it was making roughly 6 million API calls uh, to Twitter per day. 
Uh, by this stage, it was running on a T4 medium. You know, the budget was starting to creep up a little bit. Um, in April of that year, I did like one of those hyper-focusy sprint things. I took a week off work, ostensibly to have a holiday, and then I spent the whole damn week programming. Um, you know, I upgraded it to Django 4, I upgraded it to Postgres 14, I reworked the database code to make it more efficient. Um, I bootstrapped the whole thing into open telemetry and started sending data to Honeycomb, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, I finally realized that I was an idiot for running this thing in Amazon Sydney because, like, you know, I live near Sydney, well, in Wellington. Um, I should run things in Sydney. It's spending all of its time talking to the Twitter API. Where's the Twitter API? It's California. So I finally realized that actually, if you're, if, if you're going to build something, you might as well put it. Anyway, cut a lot of costs by moving it to a Graviton instance and putting it in Oregon. Um, and I set up Django Waffle and I set up a Patreon. Um, and then finally, in 2023, Twitter began, if those of, those of you who use Twitter probably know, it seems to be in basically a cultural relevance death cycle. Uh, it started letting all of the extremists back on Twitter, while at the same time sort of ending its ability to deal with abuse. Uh, and they announced that they'd be deprecating all of their free APIs in an attempt to sort of get more money from developers. Um, the free API was cut off. I was suspended from Twitter on, a, uh, sorry, my developer credentials were suspended. Uh, on Twitter mid-April, one week after I started my new job. Um, and every single login attempt in API call started returning 500s. It was effectively dead. So that was basically the life of the app. It went from 2019, sorry, 2019 to 2023. It died ignominiously at night. Uh, woke up in the morning, it was broken. Um, end of talk. Not quite. Um, that's the gist of it. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a grab bag of things that kind of happened along the way. First of all, just some numbers for a side project like this that got kind of popular. It cost me about, I'm not sure if that number is right. It cost me about $6,000 to run for its entire lifespan. Um, and about a year into it, like in 2020, I started accepting donations um, and the donations added up to just over $6,000. So I just barely didn't lose any money on it. Um, it brought in, yeah, so over three years, it grew to 70,000 users, as you saw. Uh, since early 2020, when I started logging these, it made about 4 billion Twitter API calls total. Um, according to their current pricing plan, that would be pretty expensive. Um, that would be in the millions of dollars, so it's, it's one of the reasons why it's not really. Um, the, if, if you're wondering, the most blocked person on the planet using the tool is someone you've never heard of. Um, it's someone who, it, it's probably like a bot account because they follow like 200,000 people. So it stands to reason that like the person who got blocked the most by a tool that blocks the followers of people is someone who just seems to follow everybody on Twitter. Um, one user on Secutor used the site 8,000 times. So in their, in their usage of the site, they asked to block the followers of, of people 8,000 times total. Um, another user triggered 10 million API calls on their own. So they, they probably blocked a total of 10 million people on Twitter. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why this was good for me, I guess. Um, I learned a lot of stuff do, doing this. Um, some of it I was already pretty good at, and some of it I absolutely wasn't. Um, I got a lot better at using Redis for Celery and Cache. I learned a lot more about tuning Postgres uh, for performance. Um, some pretty cool advanced Celery patterns, because the hard parts of the Celery work was um, uh, handling the rate limiting and, and the back off algorithms and just sort of the fanning out of this call triggers 100 calls to get pages of followers, which then trigger 5,000 tasks each to do the, block, uh, the blocks of the followers and sort of tuning all that stuff. Um, I got a lot better at Docker and Docker Compose because uh, that was the production platform, was just a Docker Compose file um, running on an EC2 instance. Uh, MyPy for Django stuff, struct log. A lot of these things I then brought into my workplace, um, which was really handy. It was like, oh, how did you know about this cool tool? Well, I built it over here, um, struct log, open telemetry, honeycomb, um, psycho PG2 instrumentation, and traffic for sort of load loading, um, sorry, front end load balancing stuff. Um, okay, 
I'm going to jump topics a little bit for the next little bit because I'm just going to talk about you know, my favorite parts of what kind of happened here. Um, the reason it stopped falling over dead was because I finally put user centric rate limits onto Secateur. Um, by far the biggest early mistake I made was not setting per user usage controls so that like this person over here who really needs the app because they're being attacked can't use it because this person over here has triggered the blocking of 15 million people and so it's going to take six days for that backlog to drain before coming over here. Um, this is not interesting code, but it's my favorite code on the whole thing because it was sort of simple and elegant and I got to use high school math. Who here has ever used high school math? It's amazing. Okay, some of you have used high school math. Fine. <laughs> I, I don't get to use high school math. I was very excited. It's like, it's got a gradient, you know, like the, 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 the gradient thing and like, anyway. <laughs> um, the, original, the original account controls on the site were Tom has to enable your account first. That's the thing that I got rid of pretty early. You're not allowed to block all of your own followers because that would be a recipe for some pain. Um, and I had to have a limit on like, you can't block someone, you can't block all the followers of someone with like over 500,000 followers because once you get into the millions, it's just not practical with the tools that Twitter gives you. Um, for example, to block all of Donald Trump's followers, you'd have to, with Twitter's rate limits, it would take about seven weeks just to download the list. So it's just not really practical. Um, but once I built this mechanism, I was able to keep the site online by tuning this. And that's far better than like trying to work out, oh, if I add more threads or if I switch to G event or, um, or, or is it finally time to do the DynamoDB Lambda thing. Um, eventually, with a lot of experimentation on these rate limits, what I settled for was, um, if you first signed up to Secateur, you had a bucket and, you, uh, and your bucket was full and you could block a lot of people with the tokens in that bucket and then the tokens refilled quite slowly. So maybe you could block 200,000 people when you first join. Um, but then from then on, it only refills at the rate of like 5,000 a day. And that seemed to be a very sustainable use model for this. Um, but all of that just comes from experimentation. And what was really valuable was just having the ability to, if someone came to me and said, hey, I'm being attacked by this person over here and they actually have a ton of followers, can you please help? Knowing that there was capacity in the system for me to just say, like, anyone who ever asked me that, I was able to go, yep, go for it. I've just refilled your, your rate limit, just go nuts. Um, and it meant that all the sort of drive-by background usage uh, didn't bring the whole thing down. I told you that I didn't do basically any work on the, in 2021, and that was pretty much because it got really unwieldy and scary to do, because the database by then was really big, and it was on a really small instance, and it was very difficult to test production conditions. It was impossible to test production conditions, and I thought that that meant that I was failing as a developer, right? Because you're supposed to be able to do good testing, do good unit testing, do good integration testing, do good load testing. In practice, that's really hard. Um, and when I was trying to build new features or things for this, a single sequential scan would basically bring down the whole server because the disk I.O. would be way too much for the tiny instance it was running on. Um, and if you're using Postgres as your backing store, you don't necessarily know if you've built something that's not going to use a sequential scan because Postgres's query plan or behavior changes depending on the size of your tables. So when you are working from home, um, you might f Why did I just say that? Um, when you're working on your local laptop with a couple hundred rows or a couple thousand rows, Postgres is going to behave differently to when you have 150 million or 2 billion rows in your database. Uh, so it's just very hard to deal with. At LCA last year, at the online LCA, uh, Liz Fong Jones gave a keynote address on observability engineering, and it really opened my eyes to some cool new stuff. Um, the first one was open telemetry, which I'm going to be giving a talk about at Kiwi PyCon next month, which you guys should come to. It'll be really cool. Um, um, I'm going to give a talk on open telemetry there. Open telemetry gave me the ability to see exactly where the slow and fast parts were in the running production code. Um, <clears throat> but that's not the only topic that Liz discusses in, in her keynote, because the other aspect of observability engineering is the tacit admission that there's no such environment as 
production. You, you simply can't simulate production anywhere else. And so you just have to learn how to safely develop on production. She's talking about things at the scale of Google and stuff, but it, it really counted for something like what I was dealing with, where the, um, the constraints that I was under were a bit weird. They were smaller, but they were weird because the database was really big on a really small box. Um, to be able to develop on production, I put Django Waffle in and started doing feature-based development where I could deploy it and I could roll it out to just myself, make it work for just myself, make it work for two people, make it work for four, then 1% of the user base, then two, then four, then eight. Um, it meant that I was able to get a crap ton done that I simply was too scared to do previously. So I felt like that really changed what I was able to do and I'm, I've, I'm a real sort of evangelist for it now. Um, I built this tool for myself, but I knew other people would want to use it, but I was only half right about what people wanted. Being able to block all the followers of someone attacking you was incredibly valuable. Um, but I thought the killer feature was the temporary block. I thought that was absolutely what made the tool useful. And nobody gave a crap about that. Everybody, like, uh, the overwhelming majority of the use was blocking people forever. They just didn't care about the one thing that I cared about. So I'm sure that a product manager type person will have a good lesson for you there about measuring what people want. I don't know. It, I, was, I, I, I built what I wanted, and it was mostly what other people wanted. It took me a little while to come around to asking for money, but I'm glad I did because it didn't stay as cheap to run as I would have liked. Um, I never intended to monetize the site. I never wanted to like charge people who needed protection, who needed the tool. But what I really hoped was that the people who, um, who, who could afford to donate would do so to support the people who couldn't. It worked out, but not really how I wanted. I'm, I'm still a little bit sad about this, but um, sad and grateful, the overwhelming financial support that came to the tool was people like yourselves. It was friends of mine who knew me. It wasn't necessarily the people who were using the site so much. Um, that was an interesting lesson. I don't really know what to take from that, uh, apart from thank you. Um, thank you, this couldn't really have, it couldn't have helped as many people as it did without the support of, of the people who did um, financially support it. But it was, yeah, it was, it would have been like a lot of people who gave me good financial support didn't need the tool. So I'm glad they supported it, and yet, I kind of, yeah. Um, I, I discovered that some of the weirder, uh, some of the use cases that happened just weren't um, what I think even Twitter expected. One thing that I learned that caused me a lot of problems with the site is that um, there's a gigantic subculture on Twitter that are constantly changing their usernames. Like, they put on and take off usernames like hats in the morning. They're just constantly changing them. And I get the impression that Twitter didn't really realize that either because uh, the OAuth credentials invalidate themselves every time someone changes their screen names. So that would break a lot of the mechanisms on the site, the unblock, on Secateur, the unblocking thing. Um, and it just was not a use case that I uh, ever really expected. So there was a discussion that I had in 2019 about how almost all abuse protection mechanisms can be weaponized for abuse. And I felt that this couldn't, because I felt that blocking people was one of the things uh, that couldn't really be weaponized against someone, because it really is curating your own online experience. And I'm pretty sure I was right about that, but last year there was an interesting thing uh, that... There's an, there's an argument that could be made that it, some people who I wish didn't use Secretary used it for a benefit. Um, so I'm going to tell you about how my life got a little bit more surreal uh, about a year ago. Um, during the early days of the conflict of the Russia-Ukraine war, um, there's a gigantic group of people on Twitter who are sort of harassing people who are spouting a lot of Russian propaganda. Um, and I discovered this when I discovered that my tool, Secateur, got really, really popular among Russian propagandists. 
for blocking the attacks from this other group of people. Um, I don't know if these are very readable, but you don't really need to worry about it too much. Um, things started to get a little bit weird. Uh, a lot of people were starting to notice that this group of people were using Secatura and going, okay, well, what's the deal with that tool? Who's, who's made that? What's going on? Um, I felt a bit weird about this, because like, on the one hand, I do not at all support the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And on the other hand, I built a tool that was designed to stop people from harassing people on Twitter. And this group of people were you know, a harassing mob on Twitter. So it was just people using the tool for what it was used for. Um, at a certain point, they decided to start looking into me. Um, uh, so I woke up one morning about a year ago and suddenly had a whole lot of things in my inbox about how I was helping the Russians and like who was I and was I a Russian spy? Uh, was, I, was I an agent for the Russians? Things like that. It, it got a bit weird. Um, they started digging into my websites and a few other bits and pieces. Um, at one point, they messaged some people from, who claimed to be from Anonymous, and those people sort of said, oh, look, like, this guy's clearly not a very good developer. Um, the SSL cert on his blog has expired. Uh, he clearly doesn't care much about security. Um, I was staying way out of this, because there was nothing that I could say that would like, alleviate either side, because I thought either side was kind of problematic. Um, but I really wanted to reply and say, dude, I get, I get an email every 90 days from my friend Lee to tell me that my certificate has, has expired on my blog. It's the only way I know anyone, anyone still reads it. <laughs> and so, like, it's... Things got weirder because on the Russian side, they started saying, hey, how come we never heard about this tool until a few weeks ago? Maybe it's a false flag operation by the Ukrainians to get our IP addresses. So, and the, so they started um, sort of playing mind games with each other about whose side I was on. At this point, though, I went and talked to uh, ZX Security, who uh, run KiwiCon and KawaiCon, um, and are friends of mine from Wellington, um, to sort of go, okay, well, look, if, if this becomes a bit more targeted, like, how much of my data really is online? I was talking to Simon, and he said, well, Tom, do you still live on um, Akaroa Drive? And I was like, no, but shit, how did you find that? Um, I had gone through, like, my link, I, I had gone through my LinkedIn, my RunKeeper, all those things, like, Strava. I turned off all the maps, I turned off all the friend sharing, I turned off everything except, you know, ma made everything private mode for a little while. Um, but it turns out that my phone number and my home address, my old home address, because I hadn't updated in a while, was still, like, registered on a bunch of my New Zealand domains, because New Zealand only recently added privacy protections to their Whois database, but you have to opt into them. Uh, and I had neglected to do so for some of my, some of my personal domains. Um, finally, things got, well, no. We're almost to the end of the weirdness. Um, f some of the NAFO people then said to the Russian people that I had spoken to the GCSB uh, to hand over my database. Now, I do want to just point out that the database just had public data in it anyway, right? Like, just, but they started saying, oh, yeah, I just got off the phone with Tom Eastman in New Zealand, the developer of the tool, and he has said that he is in touch with the uh, Special Intelligence Service. Um, again, like, I just didn't reply to any of this stuff, but um, I, I, I worked in security in Wellington, and you have friends who work in security in Wellington, and every once in a while they, work for the, they start working for the government, and you sort of go, oh, so what department of the government do you work for? And they get really cagey about it. They're like, just the government. Just the government. And, and so one of my friends messaged me one morning. He just pointed to that tweet. And he said, Tom, what the shit is this? And I think I, re the, I, think I replied with like a, 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 a face palm emoji. Um, but the, the biggest irony of all this is, yes, because of this weird shit, uh, I did actually have someone from a government department come and talk to me about. Uh, and they're like, like, he, yeah, he was like, Tom, what have you gotten yourself into? And I'm like, dude, I don't even, I don't even know. Um, I'm almost out of time, and I am almost out of slides. Um, I wish I had, like, a point to all this. 
it was worth it. It was really worth it. I helped a lot of people. I learned a lot of things. Some shit got a little weird. Um, I'm grateful to everyone who helped me do it. Uh, I, decide, I think one of the most important things that I learned, though, is that there's an there's a emotional and physical upper limit to how much effort that you can put into um, to fixing someone else's trash fire when they don't want it fixed. You know, I put this effort into Twitter because people I cared about relied on the tool and, and were using it to communicate. Um, if I was in the same position today, I would say, no, just get off the platform. Like, just, just it's like the, the, the degradation of the platform uh, in the last year or so has been such that I don't think there's the, an ability to protect on it. Um, I'm out of time, pretty much. The one other thing that I wanted to discuss, but I'm happy to talk about outside, is um, I, put, I put some effort into trying to keep it going after the credentials were busted. There was a couple avenues that I went down um, with credentials to like old apps that had kind of leaked and things like that. Um, and for reasons, it just wasn't going to work. Um, and finally, this happened today, which <laughs> kind of tells you, this, this, this gives you a good clear indicator of where the future of this platform is going anyway, right? So thanks everyone who helped me out with this. Thanks to everyone for listening now. I can talk about this for hours. Like any, any slide that you saw here, I, I love talking about this stuff. There's a lot more that I learned. Um, but yeah, thank you for uh, letting me, thank you for listening. <laughs>